already exists. Where? They claim it already exists. So where? To the hospital, but you and I are in this country. Companies, they run which, which, in fact, which hospital? How many hospitals in Ghana have been running 24 hours? When you go, you will not even get doctors. You will not get doctors. After some time, you will not get doctors. All you meet is the nurses. Sometimes they are sleeping. You go and wake them up. Get, get, get. Then you have to find a way to survive. They try to get the oh, doctor will come in the morning. That's what happens in Ghana. You understand? But it's not only in the healthcare sector. There are so many productive sectors of the economy. There's manufacturing, various kinds of uh, uh, goods and services being done in the manufacturing sector. There is the services sector also, which can also ride on this 24-hour economy. And so the whole idea about the 24-hour economy is just a game changer for our country. So just for starters, for we economists, we say sector is variable. So let's assume that Ghana's economy is, let's say, $100 billion economy. What it means is that all things be equal. If this is implemented to its full potential, we would be increasing Ghana's GDP, wealth of our economy, the value of our economy, by three times. That means that Ghana's economy would now be almost $300 billion worth. And you think this is not something that we should pursue aggressively. But somebody would ask, how are you going to do that? Are you just going to force everybody to go into a 24-hour production? No. Every production regime, every business owner, every business manager thrives on profitability. But most importantly, thrives on incentives because there are cost of inputs to production. Now, if the cost of inputs are such that his profitability margins will increase, and for every natural or rational human being, you want abnormal profit, right? So in business, Ideally. yes, you uh, in business, there's what we call the normal profit, which will keep you surviving. But there is also the abnormal profit, which gives you expansive band of profits. Right. Good. So if that is the objective of every business to make profit, then it means that cost of input is crucial. And the cost of input includes energy, it includes the raw materials, it includes water, it includes various utilities, and most importantly, it also includes taxes and tariffs. And so you look at the key cost of inputs. The key inputs that that you know worries profitability, that creates problems for businesses. Then, as a government, you incentivize a regime that draws down, that reduces those costs of inputs, so that it gives comfort to the the the, the businessman. That if I operate twenty four hours or I operate beyond this time, I would be able to cut down my cost of production. Mm -hmm. And if I am able to cut down my cost of production, I will have an enhanced productivity mm. or profitability and so let's look at it this way let's assume i have a business and the business runs eight hours every day and i'm making a profit of about three thousand ghana city now there is an incentive regime which encourages me to operate 24 hours it means that i will need extra hands of labor because most importantly when you are looking at the inputs there are fixed inputs and so for a 24-hour economy, if you, want, if you are running 8 hours and you want to shift into 24 hours, you don't need additional fixed inputs, capital investment. So you bought your building already, you've put in your equipment, and it's running only 8 hours. Those equipments can run 24 hours without buying additional or doing any additional capital investment. So the only investment you will need is what we call the recurrent expenditure. Which recurrent expenditure will help you run the company? So labor, raw materials, and other things that you have to put in to, to produce your yes. commodities. And so that extra investment that you put in is what government must look at. And so government is saying that I control the power. I control the water. And so I'm going to give you an incentive regime which will make it cheaper in the evenings when you are running on a 24-hour economy. For example, power. So your business has signed on to a 24-hour economy. You want to run 24 hours. And so you are given a time of use uh, 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 tariff meter. Which time of use tariff meter is now giving you a specialized rate from a certain off-peak period to the, the morning period where the, your usual eight hours will start. And so when you operate in the evening, you are having cheaper cost of energy, cheaper cost of water. And beyond that, you are having some tariff re uh, reliefs, which is bringing down your cost of production. Wouldn't you rather go with that? I believe that 
every businessman would want to go with that. But if you do that, what it means is that your profitability would shoot up beyond even the 300 percent that i am i am talking about because again if you are making profit of three thousand and now in the evenings your your cost of production has been reduced it means that your profit margin within that next eight hours would also have increased then your your the next eight hours also because you cut the cost down or you minimize the cost of production your profit margin would have been maximized in that case you are multiplying your profitability three times and more and i believe that every businessman won't do that and when you have done that it means that you have increased outputs in the country by three times and so you would be able to meet the demand that we have and so you see that most of the things that we import mostly there are businesses that produce them here but on low capacity and they are not able to meet the market and so we have to import Thankfully, we have a huge demand. And even beyond that, there is a huge opportunity in the sub-region. After has come in. So, an excess production would mean Ghana has been put on the path of global, on, on, on the global commercial market where our products would be going out of the country on export. But they've got to be going out And be able it. to build. Ex exactly. And so, it goes together. Now, when you are just like you know china some few years back china was noted for doing only fake things now most of the quality things we talk about most of the quality gadgets quality products are all from china maybe substandard is fair mm -hmm. if you say fake that's well it's well substandard and everybody you know when you wear when you carry a phone and it sounds somewhere everybody says it's a china phone you understand you watch tv and it's messing out it says it's china tv and it's something like that but most of the quality stuffs, in fact, all the brands that we used to know, the big, big brands we call the, the originals and the best quality brands and all that, now they are producing their stuff in China. And so that's how you build. You build integrity, production integrity with time. And so you will have the case where the quality and the standards are low, but with efficient policies and programs and monitoring systems by the government, you will be able to improve the quality. The you will be able to great. become competitive in the global market. And so 24 hours, I mean, it's one of the greatest ideas any government could ever have thought of. And so our manifesto is heralded by the 24-hour economy. But again, let me make the point that for the 24-hour economy to be sustainable, to really benefit Ghanaians, impact lives, and improve the living standards of the people, it would depend on a macroeconomic environment that is responsive to the, 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 the policy itself. If you don't have a good macroeconomic environment, you will not be able to achieve that. And so it is important that whilst we do that, we look at the fiscal space, we look at our fiscal policy, then we see how debilitating it has been on businesses, on, on households, on, 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 on the economy, and see how we can restructure our fiscal policy in, in a manner that it drives growth. Currently, our fiscal policies mostly drives consumption. And when you look at our budget for the past eight years, the amount that goes into infrastructure, which mostly are capital investment that drives economic growth, has been less than 1% for the past eight years. Less than 1%. We thrive, we thrive and gloat in consumption giving out two chances and I will, it will bring me quickly to uh, uh, the, the current debate. Is that not what the market has been all these years where, uh, you know, as a country we are not looking at improving the quality of what we what we have as in we have loads of materials but in a very raw state and because we are importing so much um, you have a situation where we do not think of adding value to what we have we export at a raw state, import so much uh, in, in a finished state and we are the same people who are complaining every now and then that the cost of these products are, are on the high side. Assuming maybe we added value to what we have, that, then maybe we could have prices at a relatively lower rate. Fair and valid statement, I agree with you. And maybe uh, uh, just before I get to that, which I'm going to uh, get to very soon, I was making a point about government's direction of investments. So fiscal policy, government, the biggest spender in the country, must be directed to some productive sectors. And I was making the point about how less than 1% has been you know, invested in infrastructure, for example. And the typical example is 
the problem we are we have had to deal with in agriculture today and all of a sudden out of the blue boom we have eight billion ghana seed to give to people as a relief package so we are just going to give it to them thousand ghana thousand ghana thousand ghana what effect will thousand ghana make on the lives of the people I don't want to go into the data, you know, uh, uh, defectiveness. Um, they are saying some 980,000 farmers are going to be affected, and then some 9.8 million hectares will be involved, and this thousand Ghana business that I don't want to go into the details and the misalignments and all that. But 8 billion Ghana city is now going to go to people just as reliefs, thousand, thousand, thousand. I don't, even, I don't want to even. I don't want to even look at the implications in the elections. So people, that. people want to. They, they, they want to take advantage of the, the, the crisis that we are having, and they want to throw in some money just for the election. It's an urgent situation. The farmers need Indeed, help. it's an urgent situation. But we had eight billion. Eight billion. Do you know the number of dams that eight billion can construct in this country? If we had invested eight billion. Over the last eight years, continuously, cumulatively, eight billion over the last eight years, we would be able to grow all crops all year round in this country without having issues with water technology or water supply. But within, within a matter of two months, we have found eight billion. You know how much money we have put into planting of food and jobs so far? They run into billions. Yes, it's about 3.8 billion. 3.8 billion. So planting for food and jobs is seven years old, and we put 3.8 billion. And because of this crisis, we have found <laughs> well, 8 billion, 8 billion, five. In fact, five billion more than how much we have invested in planting for food and jobs. Are we serious as a people? But we are not serious. You see, so that is the issue. The issue is that we don't have a government that is sensitive, that is forward-looking, that thinks about the economy, that thinks about the quality of life, the improvement in the lives of the people, and even the ordinary family. And that is where our resetting Ghana manifesto comes in. That's where President Muhammad's vision of a Ghana that is responsive to the needs of the people. Ghana that accelerates, and that Ghana that looks beyond our noses today. And, and, and think about sustainable programs and policies that would help benefit both the local economy and the, 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 the household economy as well. And so Kwame, if you look at the manifesto carefully, the agriculture sector, for example, we have, we have diagnosed, or if you want, we have re-look at agriculture in a different perspective. And with your permission, maybe I'll read sure, and then maybe sure, you can give sure, us sure, better sure. particulars with that. Uh, I look at um, the, the summarized one, page 19, for those of you who may be following the conversation. Irrigation and water, that's where you start with. You say we shall complete the uh, Tamni irrigation project, support rice processing factories, provide fish storage facilities and prepare the Commander Sugar Factory for takeoff. We've been going back and forth with us. We shall construct a portable water system for the people of Yendi. We shall build a phase two of the Tamni uh, Irrigation Dam project, which will be completed to boost agriculture in the Upper East region. We shall build a polygon dam to absorb spillage from the Bagri Dam. Incidentally, that's what's happening at the moment and allow farmers to farm all year round. And so clearly, we are very much open in our minds. And let me perhaps draw your mind to something. Maybe from the input sector, then I'll complete irrigation and move to other issues, sure. which are very crucial. Are you aware that the battery dam is just about being spilled? When they spill the battery dam, you see the devastating effect it has on the farms along the northern region coming down. And it happens every year. And it happens every single year. One of the reasons why we first birthed the idea of the Pualugu Dam, the Nasia Nabugu Dam, was to collect the rose, you know, uh, uh, the water when it is released, when it's fed. And before we left power, I recall very well in 2016 when the Akufuad, when President Akufuado announced that they would do one village, one dam. It was actually at a time where President Mahama had commissioned a dam in Upper East. In fact, that dam is still very functional. I've forgotten the name of the village. But that dam is still, still very functional and it's working. And so the, Im the import of that investment was to hold some of the water that comes from 
the back green down. Then you move to the Nasia Nabogo. Then you come to Palogo. So before it gets down, it, most of the dams will be collecting and filling that water. When the MPP announced one district, one dam, I recall at a point in one of the programs, I said that, look, it's a very good idea to say one district, one dam, but it only sounds well as a slogan because the districts in Accra don't need dams. But if you say you want to indeed do dams in agroecological areas, then make sure that the dams that you do are big enough so that constantly we are able to receive all the water load that comes. Because this water that comes from Bagri Dam, it doesn't come from only Burkina Faso. It comes from the top. You know how the, the, the African map is, all the countries that are coming. And the water, when it rains and hits the ground, some must go into the sea and some must go into the soil. So all the water that comes from all the landlocked countries up there are collected in the Bagri Dam, and that's why every time, even in the face of drought, the Bagri Dam must be spilled. And so if the Bagri Dam is spilled, if we have effective uh, 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 irrigation systems, effective dams built along the stretch that runs into the Volta River, there is no way we should not be able to produce one the clock in this country when it comes to food. And so we are saying that, okay, let's go back to basics. This time around, we want to heavily invest in building functional irrigation dams which irrigation dams would not only serve the purpose of agriculture but will serve a humanitarian purpose of saving those people who live around the areas that are mostly affected by this village from the dam and i think that if we are able to do that we would be significantly improving not only the livelihoods of those people but the economy as well because the great basket of this country ghana is from up north to the middle belt which middle belt carries all the 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 the, the water that is released from from the dam and so if we are able to have we have so many engineers are you aware that the one district one district or one village one dam policy was implemented without the involvement of the Ghana Irrigation Development Authority. Are you aware? And now I've heard the Ghana Irrigation Authority, I mean, crying, decrying the, 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 the why the government would do such a policy without them. They set up some secretariat, then they go and do some hand dug wells, and they call it dams. We need the engineers on the field. Professional expertise. Professional expertise. The technical men. And we have them. We have so many of them. And so I don't know why. This government will spend so much money without the requisite technical expertise to design sustainable dams and all the dams they claim they had done have now become football parks. That is a major problem. And maybe perhaps to also add that in our 120 days promise, we have promised that we are going to investigate some of these uh, uh, crimes that have been committed. That's the one you call States. oral, eh? Yes. And also help retrieve some funds. <laughs> Let, let's not tie, uh, tie in, uh, you know, the issues uh, with agriculture. You talk about support for farmers and that, that you have a long list of, uh, uh, you know, assistance that you want to provide, establishing and deploying farmer service uh, centers across the country, uh, reviving the cotton industry, uh, introducing well-established farmer cooperatives, reviving the concept of school farms, uh, reviving the Wulugu livestock uh, station, uh, building modernized agricultural economy driven by technology, employing and paying young people who live in fishing communities uh, will complete a national fisheries college, liaise with fishermen to decide on extends, uh, extending the exclusive zone. Th these, are, these are huge plans. You have only four years. We've, we've had conversations about not just your party, other parties of course. Incidentally, it's been only you and the other one, you and the umbrella, uh, you and the elephant, sorry promising heaven but when you get the nord the next thing we hear oh we have this challenge here we have that challenge here we have that challenge here so we could not implement a lot of these fine ideas you have only four years to do all of these things achievable okay so let me let me put it this way anybody can promise anything just like but you are promising no anybody anybody can promise anything and when they promise you uh, it is because they, they want your heart to follow what they have promised you. But what you should do is to interrogate the promise and see the feasibility of this promise, whether it is workable or not. Let me start by giving you a simple analysis as an agriculturist. As an agriculturist, my inputs is what motivates me to produce my capacity. 
and so I may have even thousand acres of land. If I can only afford to cultivate one acre, that's what I will do. If you are unable to get access to credit, it means that whatever finance that you have, that you are going to invest, should be able to produce enough to make profit. And the challenge is that the agro inputs are exceedingly expensive in Ghana. Too expensive in Ghana. The other inputs aspect of water I have dealt with. But what about the seed? The cost of the seed? Even the quality of the seed? Are you aware that now a kilo of the improved maize on the market is being sold for 600 Ghana seeds? The seeds, a kilo. Told. It's around that figure. 600 Ghana seeds. How is that? How can a farmer be able to buy 600 Ghana CD one kilo seed, and that will not even plant an acre of land for you? So, for the farmer, and sometimes I weep, I get very passionate about this. For those farmers that we engage with on the field, those in the northern part of the country, upper east, upper west, Sesala, Tumu, when you go, they are the kind of life they live. For that farmer to be able to get 600 Ghana CD to go and buy that seed, maize seed, and grow. And that will be after one year, and he can only plant one season. Do you think that person can survive and continue to produce? So the person will now be looking for alternative off-farm income. Which off-farm income draws him from the agriculture? And he doesn't even go back. And that is why the people who used to do agriculture in this country, somewhere in the 70s, were about 50% of our population. In fact, uh, it is some, at, at some point it was about 60 Because the motivation was yes. higher. And, and now we are struggling to make about 10% of our people in agriculture. And most of them are smallholder farms, doing small, small, small farms. You can't feed the nation. Operation Feed Yourself was successful because at the time, the food, the input cost was cheaper. No money was given to anybody to produce food under Operation Feed Yourself. But the input cost was cheaper. But what has happened to input cost today? Two things. First one, all our inputs are imported from abroad. And because all our inputs are imported, it is affected by the exchange rate volatilities, which is a function of the mismanagement and the maladministration of the government. And maybe if we have time, we will go there and see why it is so. And why the MPP have not been able to save the currency. We have some time. You yeah. understand? And so, you let me, let's focus on our break. I don't want to yeah, we'll go there. The let's focus on our break first. Yes. yes. And so now the input cost is suffering high exchange rate pass through into their prices. And for that matter, condemn that used to sell just at five cities or even four cities when we were in government is now being sold for 90 cities. 90 cities just within a short time. In fact, just last three, four years, it was 20 cities. 25 cities. Now it's almost 90 cities. How can you afford? How many will you need to cultivate a five acre land? How many kilos of uh, seeds will you need to cultivate five acre land of maize? Put all together. How much do you need to, to, to plow your land? Now, this year, plowing of one acre land is almost 500 Ghana seed. In some places it's 450, some places it's 400. A front place is 400. So, I have five acres of land as a smallholder farm. Poor man, I only survive on agriculture. And in this farming season, I have to get 500 Ghana CD for plowing. I have to get, uh, let's, let's assume, 10 kilos of maize seeds to, 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 to plant. And the 10 kilos is 600 per kilo. So, I need 6,000 for the seeds alone. I need 500 for plowing. Now, I will need several bottles of pesticides and weedicides to spray the farm throughout the crop life. So, we put all together, you are going to spend over 10,000 Ghana CD. Look at the poor farmer that is living in the village somewhere and cultivating such a small land of maize. And costing you that and much. And costing you that much. Will you produce? The and if you force to produce, there. if you force to produce and you sell your property to produce, you sell off some of the things that you have to produce. How much will you sell that commodity? How much will you sell that meat? At a price so, where you can make some profit. Exactly. And so, that is where 
our food inflation, cost of food. And that is why livelihoods have become very difficult in Ghana. And that is why we are entering into the realm of food insecurity. And so you must fix it from the basis. If you don't fix it from the input level, then you have prices. And so if you look at our policy, our policy is a policy that addresses the challenges from the input level. So I spoke about irrigation. Now let's look at the agrochemicals and the seeds and all that. And in our manifesto, you would say that. With petroleum byproducts, we have in abundance and are going to waste. And if we have all this harnessed into productive sectors of manufacturing our fertilizer in Ghana, we do not have any problem. Are you aware the amount of... We did that with just one group, the Ministry of Agri under us. In fact, it was the Ministry of Local Government when they were handling sanitation. And they built that as part of the sanitation strategy. Just they do it. They did it because they invested capital in the production of the fertilizer. Why are we not investing capital in producing inorganic fertilizer in Ghana? So that when we have produced in Ghana, we would be able to produce and sell at a cheaper rate. It will not suffer the exchange rate pass through. Because you are producing everything here. So, and so what we are import. saying, you don't need to import at all. So what we are saying is that to solve the input sector challenges, most of the inputs that we believe we have the potential to produce must be produced here. And must be made available to the farmers at a cheaper cost. But once at it, Kwame, even before you come in, once at it, you would need to be doing prospecting and the investment, and it will take time to yield response for the farmer. So you must have a quick fix in the immediate to the uh, uh, medium short, uh, long term. And what we are proposing is that we would establish a farmer services center. And listen to this very carefully. This farmer services center is going to serve the purpose of providing inputs, all the inputs to the farmer. So it becomes a one-stop shop for all the inputs. Now, this farmer services center, it means that government must participate in the production, the supply of that input. And we supply those inputs at very convenient rate for the farmer. And which convenient rate means that when you want tractor services, 400 Ghana CD you have to pay. Maybe at the farmer services center, you will get it for 200. But when you go for it for 200, you don't pay the 200 CDs cash. You go and do the work on your farm. And when you are done, you want the, the, the weedy size, you want the pesticides, you want the fertilizer. When you come to the farmer services center, you get the fertilizer, you get the inputs. You go and cultivate your crops. And when you finish cultivating your crop and you harvest, the, the farmer services center would have warehouses which can hold your commodity for you. Mm -hmm. So that when you bring your commodity and it is weighed and it is one ton of maize, we know the current value of one ton of maize. But because of the warehouse receipt system, when you bring the one ton of maize, you have brought it for storage. So you have brought one ton, they give you a chit for your one ton. So you go and sit at home and your one ton is there. If you decide, that I want to sell off my one ton immediately, and the rate gives you 10,000 Ghana CD. You take the 10,000 Ghana CD, the farmer services center take their investment in the crop, then you are, you, are, you are good to go. If you decide that you want to wait and store it for next season, so that you can take advantage of the price volatilities, and at that time you go and it is 15,000 for all the ton. You take your 15,000, government takes their difference then you are good to go. Mm. This would motivate farmers to grow exponentially. And feed us. And so, feed no, us. ultimately, ultimately, brilliant lecture. Someone would say, if it doesn't translate into anti-men who go into the market and being able to, let me give you a scenario. I like tomatoes a lot. I used to buy the, the paints, uh, I don't know how they call that one. the paint drop. Yeah, the paint drop. A little over 18 months ago, it was around 60, 70 Ghana. Yes. As of last week, I bought one for 200. I want a situation where I don't have to consistently suffer from food inflation. I want a situation where products will be readily available. I want a situation where I don't have to be spending a vast amount of my income only on food. 
Would all of this guarantee that if you get an note come December 7th? Exceedingly so. And so I started off by talking about irrigation. The problem of tomatoes is mostly growing throughout the year. It, it's a seasonal crop for us because it also thrives on rain, the rainfall part. The reason why Burkina Faso, which is a landlocked country and even a drier country than ours, are able to grow the tomato and we import so much tomato. In fact, we import almost $400 million of tomato from Burkina Faso alone. Which is crazy. Are you, are you aware that your household income from the Living Standard Survey, 40% of your household income is spent on only tomatoes? Are you aware? Mm, because so I would find its way into almost every food. Every single food we eat in Ghana is tomato. And 40% goes into that. So what it means is that simply investing in an infrastructure that can get you to produce enough tomatoes alone will save the household some 40% of their income. And it's as simple as that. And for whatever and so, reason, we are not doing that. <laughs> yes. Yeah, but for whatever strange reason, we are not doing that. And so under our agriculture for economic transformation agenda. This agenda would herald the Feeding the Ghana program. Under the Feeding the Ghana program, we have the Grains Development Program project, we have the Vegetable Development project, we have the Poultry for the Table program, and all these programs are engineered in such a way that our input management policy, which includes the land bank, I spoke about the Farmer Services Center, mm. which will give you all the inputs and all that. This land bank or farm bank policy we want to do is also to reserve some certain areas for agriculture such that young people who would want to go into agriculture will not have to worry their heads about finding lands and buying lands, going through litigation and all that. So government will use its resources to procure or to secure this farm lands available so that anybody who wants to go into commercial farming and the thing about commercial farmers is that, and I have, I have suffered that, there, there have been times I'm looking for a place that I can get 500 acres of land together to farm. And you are not able to get because this chief is having this, this family is having this. Mm -hmm. And so always you are forced to do, you know, scattered, you know, production. And you don't, and there, there, there is a thing about economies of scale in agriculture. If you have 20 acre here, you have 40 acre here, and you have 30 acre here, it becomes very difficult and expensive to manage than to have all of them together 100 acres you understand and so the economic of skills come in when you don't have the land available and you have to spend so much of your investment in securing the land before you grow but under our farm bank program this is what we are looking at we are looking at engaging the traditional authorities to secure some land for agriculture purposes only which land anybody who wants to invest in grow crops we we'll just have to go and sign on, then the government releases that to you. And so that will even help us in data collection. As we speak, we don't have any property town, the, 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 the size of cultivation that we have in Ghana. And I heard the Minister of Agriculture yesterday, and I was shocked. I don't think we are cultivating 9.8 million hectares in Ghana. It's even far more than that. But he was making that assertion yesterday. And so, if we do that, we would be able now to identify every single both commercial and smallholder farm who is on the farm bank program. Mm. And we know how much you are cultivating, the kind of crops you are cultivating, and your target and your productivity, and so on and so forth. It helps in planning. It helps in policy. And so, this is the farm bank program that we are bringing. And we believe that in as part of the implementation strategy for the farm bank program, we are going to target the areas along the main stretch of the road, main stretch of the highways. Again, there's a very important reason why we want to do that for climate reasons, for climatic reasons. Because most, every single vehicle, as we have in Ghana now, use combustive fuel and they produce carbon monoxide and carbon dioxide. Now, the thing about plants is that it is plants that consume that carbon dioxide and give us oxygen. Mm -hmm. Now, most of our highways, because of maybe, if you want, our culture, where we grew up from, when we want to live, we want to live by the roadside. You know, I want a place that is by the I roadside. I want to be close to town. I want to be close <laughs> to town. I want to be by the roadside. And so when you drive from Accra to Paga on the highway, all you see is filling stations, Hotels, kind of buildings, yeah. houses, brick and, like water, that, brick and water. You don't see that in any advanced economy. No. Go to Germany, you won't see that. 
it's only the urban areas designated for and those are not even highways they don't have you know regular vehicle traffic high vehicle traffic on those roads the highways when you drive on them all you see is green both left and right mm -hmm. and this green are not forests this green are crops that are being grown nice and trees the, and, and you see what you do what you get when you do that is that you increase the productivity of the crops because then the crops gets more carbon dioxide and for that matter are able to produce more output and more fruits for you to get higher yield and so as part of the strategy to do this farm bank we are looking at the main stretch along the highway securing that in in consultation with the chiefs for them to serve as the farm bands so that they would also become a carbon sink for the country mm -hmm. then most of the cities that are coming up and these days everywhere somebody tries to build something it becomes a city so that we can move it a little bit off the main highways then we a can into the outskirts yes then we can have a cheaper access to land litigation free land for agriculture purposes okay. so that we can commercialize agriculture in ghana agriculture is not commercialized as we speak in ghana you can count the number of commercial farmers that you we have in this country this morning i was listening to somebody and he was talking about one farmer in the, the upper west region who cultivates about thousand acres of maize then he has about three thousand acres of outgrowers and that is the biggest that you can get in ghana go elsewhere there are commercial farmers who are cultivating about 30,000 hectares and even more and, and even more Doctor, I guess what and they are using here. highly advanced mechanized systems such so that even when they are going to when they are going to spray their agrochemicals they use aeroplane to spray the because of the size of the land of because course. of the size of the land Doctor, i just want us to do a very a very very quick break and then when we return and maybe we'll spend some few minutes on other areas of your manifesto as well we're having breakfast with dr peter Gorman. Otukono, um, he's the NDC spokesperson on Akrik. The, the, the farmland. Yes. Most of which are, have been encroached. In fact, in just around Pukwase, some government has taken the portion of it for their their housing project. Uh, we don't know how that project is going, but last year they launched some housing project around Pukwase and they've taken most part of the land. The farmers that were, that were using their facilities, they have been moved out. Mm. I know about five pig farmers that were very good friends of mine that have been closed down because government has taken it away from them for housing. They don't have access to the land. And most, okay. of the, and most of the others that are left have been taken over by government functionaries, bought them all over across the country, like they are doing to parks and gardens. Good morning, Kwame. Please, I want to congratulate my senior comrade, Dr. Peter Bwama Otukono, for the big revelation, well, which is an eye-opener. The 2024 NDC Manifesto is really what our country needs now to get back on track. Surface Adi, you send this from Dakuma Kokumpe. David Sena says, I know for a fact that the NDC is already working on implementation strategies for its manifesto promises. Thank you for your message. This one says, uh, Hi Kwame, are you surprised NPP members don't understand the 24-hour economy? The flag bearer who is uh, touted as an economic whisker does not even understand this. <coughs> you say JDM is winning the election in Jesus' name. Do you know what you Are you saying it does what? But I, I want us to briefly spend some time on Coco because that conversation can't seem to go away. Depending on who you listen to, especially as to the reasons being exposed as to why we are not going for the syndicated loan anymore the ceo is telling us that they want to this year uh, you know raise those funds locally the minority in parliament is telling us that because they have not been able to get these loans <laughs> that is why they are looking at that option why can't we have a consistent communication coming in from that space what exactly is, is the challenge with our cocoa sector as we speak Pardon? The cocoa case in Ghana is rather a very sad one, a very depressing one. And that. The reason is very simple. Cocoa has become one of the key lifelines of the country. Our spine, actually our heartbeat. And cocoa fuels the economy fuels. The economy is actually struggling now because of cocoa. The exchange rate is 16 cities today because of cocoa. Inflation is what it is because of cocoa. 
the economy is in complete quagmire because of cocoa. You know why? Because cocoa is the biggest contributor of forex to Ghana. 2017, we got $2.8 billion from cocoa. 2018, we got $3.2 billion from cocoa. And you know why? Because we were producing at capacity. In fact, 2015, we were around a million metric tons of cocoa. 2016, we were around 966,000 metric tons of cocoa. 2017, we were hovering just around the same figure. 2018, we hit somewhere a million metric tons of cocoa. And do you know how, why we were able to achieve that? Because government had carefully invested in accelerated growth in the cocoa sector. 2020, we had distributed almost 20 million seedlings of to, to the cocoa farmers so that we would use that to secure the cocoa that are overaged, that are underperforming, that are underyielding, and also to fix the issue of some of the cocoas that were diseased at the time. And so that was what yielded that positive result, the continuous investment in the production sector. That was what yielded the outcome up to 2018. Mm. So our friends, being in government for the last eight years, in fact, the first two years, they did virtually nothing. The resource was procured for them. Now you will see that the production of cocoa has fallen with time to the extent that last year, we struggled to do only 300,000 metric tons. And that 300,000 metric tons, most part of it was produced in the light crop season. And in the light crop season, we don't get it on the international market. It's the local producers that mostly uh, 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 use that. And even that one last year, the local producers, the local manufacturing companies had to import some from Nigeria. And I'm sure you saw the letter. You recall the discussion when Cocoa Board, uh, the letter leaked about Cocoa Board authorizing the importation of the light yes, I did. from Nigeria. Very good. That's how deplorable and how shameful the world's number one cocoa producer has become. We have become a laughing stock. We are no more Ghana's the world's number one. And the reason is very simple. The reason is that this government has completely lost focus. They have expressed level of incompetence that has never been seen. And they have used the cocoa board as the cash cow to fund their, 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 their insatiable desire for stealing. And there cannot be any better reason. Every single year we have gone to the uh, commercial market for cocoa syndicated loan of about a billion dollars. Now, this billion dollars that we go for, because of the insatiable desire for consumption by the government, the monies that Cocoa Board bring in do not really fund cocoa activities, but fund government's consumption, most ostensibly. And so, mostly they are not able to pay because the monies do not bring the returns that it's supposed to bring. Now, when you bring, when you go and take the syndicated loan, this is the broad objective of the syndicated loan. You pick the loan to go and buy the cocoa beans so that you can sell the cocoa beans within that crop period. Then you go and pay back the syndicated loan with the interest. Now, it is believed that as you buy the cocoa beans, you would invest some of the syndicated loan in the production sectors so that the production, the productivity would increase, so that your profitability would also increase. Then you would be able to pay your debt sustainably and always be able to raise the funding for that because cocoa can always pay itself. Now, the sector has become exceedingly risky. Cocoa, which is one of the low-risk production centers in agriculture, has become exceedingly risky that now financial markets are not willing to look at your face because, one, you are underproducing. Two, you have gone into forward sales agreements that are not profitable. Three, you are wasting your money and you have gone into debt crisis and you are unable to pay back the syndicated loan. And so you have even, apart from the commercial syndicated loan that you go from the external market, do you know that Cocoa Board also borrowed from the domestic market? Yes. And the domestic markets alone, they are owing 13 billion Ghana CD. And they have had to go through painful haircut. Or is it headcut? Haircuts. It's not haircut. <laughs> very, very painful haircut. It's not coming. <laughs> and and the thirteen billion had to be restructured. And last year, 
They have structured about 7 billion of that amount of money to about the next 5 years or 10 years. That means that all those people who had invested their monies in the banks are not going to have access to those monies. And you expect any financial analyst to sit anywhere in any bank and analyze the kind of economic quagmire that you are in, this disastrous economic situation, and grant you a loan to go and buy. The board is not making a policy decision not to go to international market. No, they don't have the, that luxury. They are being forced to stay away from the international market. They go there, nobody looks at them. The syndicated loan is one of the cheapest loan sources that we ever get on any market. So the interest Mostly rate is reached up about 8%. Low. Oh, the highest was the 8% that you know, which is the last two years one that we were, we were getting. Even that one, we didn't get all. Then, the, in fact, the highest we had gotten for syndicated loan until Akufuado saw the seat of government was around 3%. 3% for all the syndicated loans. Because it's a specialized kind of loan and because it goes into cocoa, the, the banks that give those loans give it a special rate because the risk is lower. The highest we got was the 8% and that is the highest in the history of the world any country will get for cocoa loan. But we took that and we have defaulted. And, it's a and so like now, that. when you go to the international market, your risk is so high so that if they will give you a syndicated loan, they would have to be factoring all the risk and it would be exceedingly expensive. But worse of it all, because of the debt challenges, the debt overhang, the international market, just as the euro bond has rejected us, just as all the markets have rejected us, cocoa bond has also been rejected. And even when they go, they will not open the door for them to sit down to make an excuse. And so they are not getting the money anywhere. Last year, they didn't get it. This year, they will not get it. So you are forced to eat your humble pie and find a way to come and tell us stories. What they are telling us is a Kukwanasi story. They don't have anywhere to go. Look at the current financial sector in Ghana. Do you think Cocoa Board can raise $1 billion from the current financial sector in Ghana? With all the head cut that has gone on, with how the, uh, the, the banks are suffering liquidity, you think they can do that? Bank of Ghana has over, over cut money. To the extent that they are in debt, how are you going to survive that? If, if you can tie all of this in with the state of our economy at this point, because you make you make a very striking comment about how the challenges in our cocoa sector are highest earning for it is is causing a lot of problems for us. What, what is your understanding of the state of the economy now? Let me that you would want to change in four months. Exactly. Let me let me let me land on. You have five minutes to do this. Land on yes. Let me land on this cocoa thing. And so, they are not going to get the money to buy the cocoa. First of all, they are suffering low yields. There will not be much cocoa to buy. The cocoa board is owing about three hundred thousand metric tons of cocoa that they have to supply to the market because they have gone into what we call the forward sales agreement. The forward sales agreement allows you to buy the cocoa or to sell your cocoa off at a particular price over a long period. And the last time that we sold off our cocoa was around $3,200 per ton. In actual fact, as it stands now, the spot price of cocoa is around $6,800 per ton. And so it means that we are losing about $3,600 from spot price market. And are you aware that as I just last two months, the current forward price sales of cocoa on the International Cocoa Exchange is $9,600. And we have sold ours for $3,200 years back. And we are, our hands are tied. Who committed this cadenas into the country? And the cocoa farmers are suffering because of that. Because irrespective of how much the price on the international market goes up, the cocoa farmer cannot benefit. And the input prices are still on the rise. Exchange rate is on the roof. And so they cannot even buy the inputs to produce. And their hands are tied with the amount of money we are giving them from the cocoa. Why would we be this wicked to the cocoa farmer? And how do you expect the cocoa farmer to go through this pain and still produce more for you? And so now, last year, we are owing 300,000 metric tons to those who have collected their money that will supply. This year is going to be worse because the yields will even be lower than that of last year. And so... How are we going to cure this? 
President Mahama is saying in our policy that let's go back to basis. Let's go back to supplying the free seedlings to the farmers. Cocoa rehabilitation, this government started, they got the people to cut down the trees and they said they were going to give them the seedlings. Up to today, majority of the farmers, about 80% of them, have not received the seedlings. They said that they were going to give them some alleviation just as they have announced for the, 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 the dry spell that they are going to give some money to the people. They promised them they said 500 Ghana. Even the 500 Ghana has become a problem. They have not been able to receive. Yet the seedlings have not gone. So most of the cocos that are cut down have not been grown back. How do you fix it? So we are saying that we are going to distribute the free seedlings again and we'll go back to the free fertilizer, cocoa fertilizer for the farmers to improve the productivity of the farmers. Then when we have improved that, we go back to the formula that we were producing about almost 70% of the, the cocoa price to the farmer. Then we add the cocoa bonus that is due them, that is paid by the international market on top of the cocoa prices to the farmer to motivate them to grow more. Because if we don't improve cocoa production in Ghana, our economy will continue to dip and dip and dip and dip. Because it is the greatest source of forest. Would you also address the PBC now, as well? Oh, yes. Because when you... They were here last two weeks. Yes. It was terrible. It's a very sad situation. How can PBC collapse? PBC. How can you, how can you buy cocoa and collapse? What? Mismanagement. Corruption. Tivri. Plain Tivri. Plain Tivri. It has gotten PBC to collapse. And so, now, look at the climatic conditions of the cocoa growing areas. Look at how this government's reckless decision of government officials participating in Galamse, illegal mining, and the government committing the greatest illegality of all time by smuggling the amendments in the, 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 the laws to allow for mining in the forest zones. And because of that mining, it is changing the climatic conditions in the, agro, uh, in the cocoa growing areas. Now, the thing about cocoa is that it thrives mainly on a certain climatic condition. And that is why you can't grow cocoa in the north, even though the land is arable. When you look at the Middle Belt, from Oti region, coming down to Hohoi, all those places are cocoa areas. Now, we have moved away from growing cocoa in those areas. But our vision as a government is also to go back and look at the prospects of growing cocoa in all those areas because now the cocos are yielding the cocoa are yielding less in the southern belt the western belt and all those places that we used to have high yielding cocoa because of the mining and so we must look at expanding our production frontiers to the middle belt as well so that we can improve cocoa production mm. among other you know uh, cash crops that we have to look at including cotton which we have made a case for in our manifesto including palm oil and we believe that if we are able to look at this and invest consciously, like Singapore did, Singapore came from Dr. the palm tree for years. Seconds for me. Yes, Singapore came because um, I speak on that. I break it so big. I know. We can do that, can't do that in one day. Uh -huh. I know. Yeah. And so maybe we'll come back and do the. We'll probably have to time. do a part two. Yeah. Yeah, we'll do the economy some other time. But most importantly, all that I'm saying is that Singapore picked palm uh, fruits from here, planted palm nuts for the first time in Singapore. Now, they are the biggest, the largest producer of palm and palm oil and palm products in the world, the entire world. We have written in our manifesto what we call the red gold. We believe it is now time for us to go back to business, reinvest in palm production, reinvest in cotton production, reinvest in cocoa. And that will do the then trick. Then that will do the trick because remember that gold is a mineral resource that is exhaustible. But cocoa can always be grown. Okay. Palm can always be grown. Mm.